Hello, and welcome back to Chapter 7, Applications of Integration. Today we're going to look at Section 7.2, and this is going to be the first part, um, and we're going to look at volume, specifically the disk method. The objectives of this section are going to be to find the volume of a solid of revolution using the disk method and the washer method, and then in Part 2 we're going to look at finding the volume of a solid with a known cross-section. So, for this method, if we have some region um, in a plane that's, a, in this case, it's going to be revolved around a line, and specifically um, we're going to look at this x-axis here. This is what we call a solid of revolution, and the line that we're revolving the solid around is called the axis of revolution. Um, the simplest um, shape that we're going to use is actually a right circular cylinder, which is what we're going to call a disk. And this is when we revolve this rectangle right here, kind of about this axis, kind of in a circular motion, okay? Um, and you can kind of see what that 3D solid is going to look like right here. You'll see that we have a width, and then we have this circular surface right here that we can actually find the area of. And hopefully you remember that the volume of a disk is the area of the circle times the width of the, the disk or the height. So, um, and you can see that equation is down here. Okay, so as we just mentioned, the volume of a disk is found by taking the area of the disk and multiplying it by the width. And the area of the disk, since it is a circular shape, is equal to pi r squared. And then um, the width then is just the w. To see how to use the volume of a disk to find a volume, let's look at this original curve right here. This right here is just a 2D graph. Now if I go through and I take some subsection of that, and I rotate it around my axis, I'm going to get something that looks like this middle graph right here. This is the 3D version of that. Now if you look specifically at this um, little subsection, which is kind of highlighted in yellow, this is what I'm actually looking for at this point in time, or this delta x. Now if I go and I take and I make this entire shape in all of those widths, which is kind of what I have here in this third graph, and I add up all of those volumes, I'm going to eventually come up with something pretty close to the volume of that shape. So what the disk method says um, is to find the volume, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep in mind that I have that rectangular shape, um, which is going to be looked at as my delta x, and I'm going to multiply that by the area of that circle, or my pi r squared. Now we know from previous um, sections that if I take and I add up all of those um, rectangular regions, um, which are now 3D solids, if I add up all those volumes, I'm eventually going to get the volume of a solid. And the more, or I guess the tinier those little slices are going to be, or the smaller my delta x is, the more accurate my volume measurement's going to be. And you can see that here um, with your limit equation that that's exactly what's going to happen. So essentially when we find our solid, we want to know that the volume of a solid of revolution is equal to pi times the integral from a to b of my radius squared times dx. Now my radius is actually most likely going to be like the height, that, depending on which axis um, I'm taking or I'm integrating with respect to, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Actually, we're going to talk about it right now. <laughs> um, for the disk method, if you are looking at a horizontal axis of revolution, in other words, you are result or revolving something around the x-axis, okay, we're going to find our volume by taking the area of the circle, which in this case is pi, because that's a constant, I'm going to bring it outside of my integral, multiple, and then inside or underneath my integral, I'm going to have my r squared, which is my radius, and I'm going to multiply that by the change in x. Okay, so if I mul if I rotate my rectangular region around this x-axis, I'm going to do it with respect to or integrate with respect to x. Now, if I do the other method where I rotate my region around the y-axis, as I um, look over here to the right. Um, now I'm going to have to re I'm going to revolve that, and this is going to I'm going to have to integrate with respect to y now. So I still have my volume equation as being volume is equal to pi, the constant times the integral, and now I'm looking at c and d because these are my y values, and I'm going to integrate uh, my function or my radius r with respect to y now or d dy. 
Now, if we look at example one, where we're using the disk method, we want to find the volume of the solid that's formed by revolving the region bounded by the graph of f of x equals the square root of sine x and the x-axis between zero and pi specifically, we want to take that graph and rotate it around the x-axis. So you're going to end up looking, um, your graph is going to look something like this, and I would highly suggest that you graph these, if at all possible. Okay, and because I'm rotating it around the x-axis, I know that I'm going to be integrating with respect to x. We also have to go in and find the radius of our function. Because I'm rotating this around the x-axis, I see that no matter where I go, my radius of this region is always going to be hitting that graph of f of x equals sine of x. So my radius actually equals f of x, or we can say that the radius is equal to the square root of sine x. So take my original equation, volume is equal to pi times the integral from a to b of my radius squared times the change in x. I end up with the integral from 0 to pi. Um, my radius, we said, was the square root of sine x, and I have to square that times dx. So I get pi times the integral from 0 to pi of sine x, because si the square root of sine x squared is going to give me sine x dx. When I integrate sine x, I end up with a negative cosine x, so I have pi times negative cosine x, and I have to evaluate negative cosine x from 0 to pi. When I plug in pi in for x, a negative cosine of pi gives me this positive 1, and a negative cosine of 0, because I'm subtracting, is actually going to give me a positive, because it would be minus a negative, which is actually a positive. So 1 plus 1 is 2, times the pi gives me my 2 pi. Now I do have one more example. Oops, sorry. This example is example two. And this example deals with revolving about a line that's not a coordinate axis. So we're not going to be revolving our solid around the x-axis or the y-axis, but rather another line. So example two says to find... Okay, so we're going to find the volume of a solid formed by revolving the equation f of x equals 2 minus x squared and g of x equals 1 about the line y equals 1. So if I go in and I sketch this, what you'll see is that you end up with something that looks like this. And your revolve, let's see, so this equation here is your 2 minus x squared. And it tells you that g of x equals 1. So that's just the line really y equals 1. So you're going to take this region right here and rotate it around the line y equals 1. So you'll be rotating it around this line here. When you do that, what you'll find is you actually get something, oops, and this should come down just before 2, sorry, but something that looks kind of like this, and it would be a 3D image. So you're actually rotating around this axis here. To find my radius, so we'll say r of x is going to equal the difference between my f of x and my g of x. So I'm going to go 2 minus x squared minus 1 equals my radius. So this is going to give me oops, sorry, 1 minus x squared for my radius. Now that I have my radius, I also have to find out what I'm going to be setting my upper and lower bounds for my um, integration. So to do that, I need to find out when my two graphs are equal. So I'm going to set f of x, oops, sorry, f of x equal to g of x and find my points of intersection. If I have 2 minus x squared is equal to 1, if I move my x squared over from the left side to the right side and move my 2 over, I see that I get 0 is equal to x squared minus 1. And I know that I can factor that, which gives me x minus 1 and x plus 1 
or x is equal to plus or minus 1. So these here are going to be my boundaries for integration. So now when I go to calculate my volume, we know that volume is equal to pi times the integral of my radius squared, and we said our radius was 1 minus x squared, that quantity squared, dx, and I'm integrating between negative 1 and a positive 1, so I'm going to go in and fill in my boundaries. And when I do this, I get pi times the integral from negative 1 to 1, and when I square the quantity of 1 minus x squared, I end up with x to the fourth minus 2x squared plus 1 dx. So now when I integrate, we end up with, and you can type this in your calculator since we reviewed that, or you can um, go ahead and do it by hand, but either way you should still get 16 pi divided by 15 for a volume. The next method we're going to look at is the washer method. Now a washer is formed when you take a small section, kind of like what we have here. Let me. Okay, it's not really touching the axis, but we're going to rotate it around the axis. And when we rotate this little cross section, as you can see in the figure below, you actually get a 3D image that has an outer radius here and you have an inner radius because of the gap that occurs between the bottom of the rectangle and the axis itself. Now, if you stop and think about this, to calculate the volume of just a wash, or I'm sorry, just a disc, I would have to calculate, find the area of the outer radius, um, and then I'm going to multiply that by the thickness, okay? And the area of this, the outer radius would be the pi r squared, then if I wanted to calculate the area of my inner circle, I would do the area of this inner radius, or the circle with the inner radius, times this thickness. And then to get the difference, I would have to subtract those two. So you actually get that the volume of the washer is equal to pi times your outer radius, which is the capital R squared, minus your inner radius squared times the width of your um, washer. When you're doing these problems, I really want you to think about a washer as the difference of two discs, and I think things will go a lot better for you. Now let's look at the region bound by an outer radius, okay, which in this case is going to be formed from this line, as you can see right here, and that's going to be represented by the capital R in the inner radius of the other function, which is going to be represented, you can kind of see it better down here, but it's going to be that arc. Okay, and this is going to be called the inner radius or the lowercase r. Now, to go to calculate the volume, you need to do the difference because you need to do the outer radius. And if we go, well, if you take the outer radius and you want to subtract the whole out or the inner radius. So this gives, is given to us by the volume is equal to pi times the integral from a to b of the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared times dx. Now let's look at example three where we have to use the washer method. Example three says to find the volume of the solid formed by revolving the region bounded by the graphs y equals the square root of x and y equals x squared about the x-axis. So if you graph these two, you'll see that you end up with the function of y equals the square root of x and this lower one here, which is really y equals x squared, you see that they intersect at the point 1, 1, and we're going to revolve this around the x-axis. So when I revolve this, I actually end up with this type of a figure here. Looking at this, I see that my outer radius, which is the capital Rx, is really equal to the square root of x, and my inner radius, which is the little r, is equal to x squared. So if I want to go and find my volume, I know that volume is going to, equal to be equal to the pi times the integral, and I'm going from 0 to 1 of my outer radius, which we said was the square root of x squared, 
minus my inner radius, which was x squared, and I'm going to square that, times dx, or the width. So now if I go ahead and simplify, I see that I have pi times the square root of x squared is really x, minus x squared squared, which is x to the fourth. So if I integrate that by hand, I get x squared divided by 2 minus x to the fifth divided by 5. I'm going to evaluate that from 0 to 1 and then multiply that answer by pi. And you'll see that we get 3 pi over 10. Now you can also do this on your calculator. You just have to remember to multiply your final answer by this pi here. And this will conclude um, part 1 of exam um, section 7.2.